Howdy, lieutenants and economists. The most volatile, evil, disgusting things on the planet, humans. If you have a video request, you can always go to assholeconsulting.com. Yeah, I am gonna charge you, kids. And that is the importance of not fucking up. You are such an asshole! Hey everybody, old captain here. We got an interesting uh, request from Paul. And Paul wants to know about the uh, permanent portfolios. Uh, and I'll read his email here because it'll explain because I didn't know anything about it and I took notes on this earlier today at the bar. Dear Mr. Clary, I recently discovered your YouTube channel and have watched several videos from your online library with a specific interest in those pertaining to retirement savings and financial freedom. What is your opinion of Harry Brown's permanent portfolio? I have never heard you mention it, so forgive me if you already have. He contends that there are four normal economic conditions, prosperity, recession, inflation, and deflation. His permanent portfolio concept calls for uh, holding equal ratios, 25% each, of stocks, cash, gold, and long-term government bonds to hedge each of the four economic conditions in respective order. Over the past 45 years, this portfolio has generated returns equal to the classic 60-40 uh, stocks over bonds portfolio, but with far less volatility. Further, the worst uh, down year was in 1981 with only a 5% decline. This is not a trivial track record. I bring this topic up because I have real skin in the game. Currently invested 70-30 stocks over bonds. I'm 52 years old. I'm not asking for investment advice, merely your opinion of the permanent portfolio concept because it is one of the alternatives I'm considering. Would you please send me a quote for the video response? Take care, Paul. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so I had to look into it and um, it's exactly what Paul said. It's Harry Brown, the libertarian a presidential candidate. Uh, he came up, you know, 25% stocks, 25% bonds, 25% precious metal, and 25% cash. And I looked into it and, and so we're going to go through empirically what has happened and then we're going to talk what theoretically will happen in the future because those are two very important and different things. Historically speaking, this simple model, this simple strategy is just as Paul says, it has worked. Uh, and, and there is no, understand with, with traditional financial planning, all they have is rules of thumb. All they have the ability to do is go back in the past and look and say, okay, given what has happened in the past, what model would best work given the past? And then we assume that the performance of the markets are going to continue on the same way over the long term on average. And so this model would have resulted in these types of returns and thus we have this investment strategy. And we hope then in the past it continues on in the future. And that's the only thing you could do because you have nothing to go on but the past. You cannot study the future. It hasn't happened yet. And so that's why there's always a legal disclaimer in, in financial advising and law and all this other. We cannot predict the future. This is why I do not give specific investment advice uh, because I can't tell you what's going to happen in the future. But if we look back at this model, this strategy, Paul's correct. This has uh, done rather well. Now, it depends on how what measure you want to look at. Everyone says to compare it to the S&P 500, but that's slightly erroneous to do. Uh, because the it, it, this is a mixed portfolio. The S&P 500 is, is all stocks, so you want to compare it to a mixed portfolio. And if you go on Morningstar.com and you look up the uh, permanent portfolio, of which there's an ETF variation, which has not been around that long, <coughs> and a, I got my notes here, and a, a regular mutual fund index sort of tracking. That's a, the ticker symbol is PRPFX. If you want to look at it, go to Morningstar.com. <clears throat> and if you compare it as far back as the data goes on Morningstar, which goes back to 1982, it has beaten its respective index. Not the S&P 500, but its respective index. The index that it was supposed to match or beat. And it's done so, uh, not, not, well, in some points it has done wonderfully beating the index. Uh, in other points, but it has, at least over the long haul, provided higher rates of return and, as Paul ex expected, lower risk, less volatility, and that's measured by the beta, which is a statistical measure if you want, you can look it up. But the beta of this investment portfolio is 0.7 compared to the S&P 500. So very roughly translated into normal person's language, it is only 70% as volatile as the S&P 500. So if the S&P 500 goes up 10%, this will go up only 70%. If the S&P goes down 10%, this will only go down 7% on average, historically speaking. 
Uh, so since it is not <clears throat> to be that, just to give you some perspective, going back to 1982, if you invested $10,000, you would only have $71,000 in this account. So it increased sevenfold since 1982. Had you invested it in an all stock account, it would today, the S&P 500, have 331,000. So four and a half, almost five times, four and a half times what you would normally have in the, um, in the, free, in the uh, permanent fund. But compared to equivalent like 60-40, 70-30 type uh, mixed indices, you'd only have $60,000. So this does the job. If you look at it by every traditional and modern day form of financial analysis and performance, it's lower risk and higher performing. And that's rare. And that beats it. And <clears throat> what I like about it as well is that it's simple. A fourth, a fourth, a fourth, a fourth. And it's in its simplicity is its brilliance. It's like, okay, we have stocks for the upside potential, bonds for the low risk potential or stability and income generation. You have uh, precious metals in case the shit hits the fan. And then you have cash, which they, they invest in short term securities or treasuries rather. But um, in case you want to like maneuver your position, you have that, that uh, maneuverability. So uh, analyzing it from that perspective, yes, this is a great little tool. All right, uh, but now here's the problems, and this is where the theoretical side comes in. Historically, this has performed well, <clears throat> and you know, if we all lived in 1981, we invested in it, we'd be doing as well again. But looking into the for the future, it's very difficult. It's not very difficult. It's impossible, 100% impossible to tell what's going to happen. So this is just my opinion and just my take. This is just what I think might happen or my views on the permanent portfolio going forward. And I could be 100% wrong because I'm a good economist. There are the economists who know they don't know and the economists who don't know they don't know. And I'm one of the economists that know he doesn't know, which makes me better than about 80% of them because the rest of them think it's a fucking science that it's not. So going forward. Now, in terms of Paul's specific situation, he's 52. I like it. We had another email exchange where he's saying, like, you know, over the long haul, this has provided pretty good returns. The ups and the downs, da 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 da, -da. I, I survived the 2000 crash, the, the 2007 crash. So he's, he's pretty good. But he says, well, but I'm 52. I'm about to approach retirement, and I don't know if I can handle another crash. So should I be looking at something like that? No, because we were talking in a shorter historical context, like looking back at the past 10 years, not only did this permanent portfolio kick the shit out of its traditional index that's compared to it, it beat the S&P 500. Why? Well, because the stock market crashed and precious metals went up. Since the S&P 500, the stock market, does not have precious metals in it, uh, this thing, it, it, it performed as it was designed. The precious metals went up, it, it hedged, it lowered the risk of the, his investment portfolio. And so he, he weathered that storm very well. Now, of course, the opposite is happening. Stocks are going up, precious metals are going down. But again, he, he's, you know, he, he's, it, it's underperforming compared to the S&P 500. But again, it's not supposed to match stocks. So, if, and the fact that you're approaching retirement age and you can afford less risk, I think this is a great um, tool. Uh, it, it's very well diversified. I'm going to assume you have a minimalist lifestyle. You don't need tons of money. You're not a soccer mom, trophy wife. Um, I'm used to having everything paid for. Um, my daddy handed me the business, and then I ran into the fucking ground because I'm a frat boy douche, and I never built it. And now I'm, you know, I got a lot of people who come up to me. They're 58, and they're like, well, I had all this, but then it went away. I guess the IRS wanted me to pay taxes. Now they're fucked. They have no retirement, and and they're uh, they're also accustomed to living a very high lifestyle. So if you're a minimalist. You got your money. I don't know if I'd be like rushing to convert this all into bonds or anything like that. And the other thing you have to think about when you're 52 years, everyone thinks like, oh, I'm, I'm retired at 62 or 65 and I switch all the bonds. No, you might live another 30 to 40 years. You need these assets to generate income. Uh, so you, and potentially have some capital gains. You don't want to like all switch to bonds unless you got a huge amount of capital stored up and you can live off of 3% a year and 3% a year generates enough annual income for you to, to live. Okay, then fine, convert all the way to bonds. Uh, but usually you want to have a, at least a little bit left in stocks and, <clears throat> and equities so that there's a potential that as the stock market goes up, you even have more capital gains. 
Uh, so I think this fits that perfectly. You have your fixed income. You're, you're relatively young. You're not even retirement age. Um, you're relatively young, so you do want to have that upside potential with stocks. Uh, your bonds, you seem more of a traditional conservative investor, so I think those long-term safe quality bonds is a, is a good position to have as well. You have your insurance against the oh shit world hitting the fan, hyperinflation with your precious metals. And then cash in case whatever you wanted to like go take a position in something else. Um, there are only two things I would add to this to further supplement your current strategy. One, I know you're invested in precious metals indirectly, but if you don't hold it, you don't own it. So I would start, you know, I always recommend 200 pieces of silver. Okay, that's what I recommend for the average individual, 200 pieces. I could be wrong. Lord knows I'll be wrong. When everything is said and done, I'll die. And the lords and the angels of actuarial science will come down and say it was 198 pieces of silver. Bad, bad, bad economist there, and Clary, you're off by two. A very, very bad, wrong, lying sack of shit economist you were. Down to hell with you. Uh, but to ha please take some physical possession of precious metals in case the shit hits the fan and electricity shuts off and you can't access your permanent fund, uh, mutual fund. <clears throat> the other thing is I would consider real estate as well. Um, it's kind of this permanent portfolio fund is a little outdated in that various securities allow you to invest in other assets. More recently, uh, since Harry Brown probably put this together, is real estate in the form of real estate investment trusts. I did read a little bit of something about how um, real estate is now starting to be imbued in some of these variants of the permanent portfolio. So either you have your house, or I would maybe kind of supplement it by buying into real estate investment trusts or ETFs that invest in um, real estate. Uh, again, just to provide yet another general asset category to further diversify your overall portfolio. But otherwise, yeah, as long as you're not like ape shit crazy and you need to go spend a shit ton of money and own horses in your retirement, some other fucking bullshit like that, I, I really do like the permanent portfolio. I, I do indeed. Um, and, and yeah, I, I understand your concerns. Like the equity is like, God almighty, one, you know, equities are so overvalued. Bonds are paying jack shit and they're overvalued. too. I, I understand all that. Uh, but like I said before, the reason I really like this, the simplicity. I mean, this is why index funds and ETFs do so well. You don't have to spend your time researching. Forget stocks. You know, mutual funds were a big advantage, a big improvement over individual investing. It's like, well, we'll just diversify. You, you lower your risk dramatically. And you, and then in one transaction, one brokerage, one commission payment, one commission fee, you diversify into all these various securities, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and everything else. <clears throat> well, now we're improving upon that with indexed funds because of its simplicity. It's like, look, the vast majority of people don't beat the index. So we're just going to have these ETFs or index funds that track the index, the S&P 500, the Dow Jones, the Wilshire, or whatever. Um, it's not Lee Barclays uh, bond index because Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. <laughs> Uh, so this additional ease of management, so I'm all for ease because look, look, it, as long as you got enough money, you're okay. Money's not the most important thing, it's time. And I've seen people like, you know, they're always analyzing, you want to spend three hours a day analyzing your fucking finances? You just need enough to get through to die. Uh, the, 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 the economist, I forget who the, the professor was, he says, ideally, when you spend your last cent, you would die of natural causes because you would you have consumed all that you produced. Typically, though, this may not hold up into the future. People leave assets after they die, so they produce more than what they're going to consume. Now, I think that will change, especially given the baby boomers in my generation and definitely the millennials. Um, so you you don't have to make gobs of money. Have fun time with your family. Have fun time with your kids. Enjoy retirement. You you shouldn't spend more. You know, keep a pulse on it, especially with the internet now. You know, you could you could set your Yahoo Mail or whatever mail you got to pop up your the performance of your your investments. Keep your tab on it. You know, look at it five minutes for the day. See what's going on. Okay, that's it. That's all you really want to do. You don't want to be spending days and weeks, you know, hours a day just looking into, oh, what happened? Oh, how did earnings come in? Fuck all that bullshit. Life is too short for that crap. So, yeah, between the user funds and the index funds, and, and, and now this, like the freedom funds, or they call them target date funds, where you 
target your date. And this permanent portfolio is for your age, for your age. I wouldn't recommend this for a younger person or, or someone who's on the verge of death. But for your age that and your investment mentality, I think the permanent portfolio is, is kind of the way to go. Again, you could lose it all tomorrow. You could lose it all, be all fucked up. You say, oh, fuck, bad, bad economists. You're a very, very bad, bad economists. Yes, yes, I am, but I'm still better than the ones that think they know. So anyway, hope that helps. Hope people learned a little bit about the permanent po uh, portfolio. Take a look at it online. And uh, as always, spread the good word of asshole consulting. Have a friend, have a family member, have uh, someone you give a shit about who needs a swift kick in the ass. Have them go to assholeconsulting.com and pay me money. Toodles.